AIS and from the studios of Radiant Images here in Los Angeles. Welcome back. I'm joined by our chairman of AIS from Google, Buzz Hayes. Good morning, Buzz. Good morning, Jim. How are you? Well, I'm fine. Uh, we are absolutely delighted. We've got people joining us this morning from uh, already checking in from Buenos Aires and, and uh, Portland, Oregon. We'll start the show in uh, fewer than 10 minutes here at 11 o'clock, but it's it's nice to have people chiming in. Have you uh, have you had your flu shot, Buzz? Uh, just about to. Yeah, we've actually okay. uh, we have a um, a service that will come to the house and and give the flu shots to the family. I got mine yesterday, and I said, now how does this? Will this? Uh, I know it helps on the flu. Will this uh, handle symptoms of Antifa? And uh, they said, uh, no, actually, it's not going to help Antifa. So I'm looking for that vaccine. Um, apparently, the you know your head explodes. So anyway, um, how are you? What's going on at Google this week? Good, uh, busy, you know, lots of people figuring out ways to get back to work. And, you know, for a while we were talking about the best way to get back to work. Now people are actually getting back to work in a lot of cases. So um, we've been keeping pretty busy, you know. Um, I think we've accelerated the plans of what we were hoping to do in a year from now or so, uh, just because people need to, to um, edit and, and color correct and uh, do computer graphics and animation and things from uh, wherever they happen to be right now. So, yeah, we're keeping pretty busy. I, we're going to talk about uh, some of the poll results of the last two weeks in today's show, but uh, it struck us uh, to look at what all of our viewers were saying over the last two weeks about when they thought they'd be back at work. And, you know, they're thinking that uh, we're going to be working like this for uh, some time. And we'll have those results in the show today. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, we've even talked at Google about this notion of what they're referring to as a, as a hybrid approach to going back to work where the offices will be used for group meetings when people need to be in person. And otherwise people rely on working from their home office for the indefinite future. Um, in today's show, we've got, uh, uh, we're gonna talk about virtual stages. We're gonna have uh, Dell talk about the tech stack that helps you uh, maximize your work productivity right now and safety on the set and uh, uh, all the protocols that are being put in place for um, safe uh, uh, production sets. Um, but interestingly, uh, we're going to play some trailers. And it struck me that one of the things we miss the most about going to the movie theaters is seeing the upcoming uh, uh, movies. And when I, when we were looking at the trailers a couple of new ones out, when we looked at them yesterday, you think, well, this reminds me why I love going to the movies. And it reminds me why I love our industry. So we're going to show some trailers today. Did you uh, did you see James Cameron has uh, checked in from New Zealand this week, and he's saying uh, Avatar Two is almost done. Avatar Three is almost almost done. Hundred percent complete with Avatar Two. Ninety five percent complete on Avatar Three. We're able to shoot, have more or less a normal life. We're fortunate. Don't see any roadblock to us getting the pictures finished. Both pictures finished. Um, uh, on time from here on. So that's kind of encouraging news. It really is. I mean, and talk about a complicated production to keep going during these times. Uh, that, that's probably the most technologically advanced bit of film production that's ever been attempted. So to be able to actually pull that off at this point is, is pretty remarkable. Only James Cameron, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, the New York Times this morning uh, came out with its uh, top 10 uh, movies not to miss um, in October. You want to hear a couple of them? Sure. Mandalorian season two. Uh, they say it's pretty fantastic. It uh, starts streaming on October 30th. John Favreau obviously is back at the helm of that. Um, I like this one from Hulu. This is October 23rd. Bad Hair. It's a comedy horror movie starring L. Lorraine, writer-director Justin Simeon. What if a woman's hair weave is possessed by the devil and evil spirits? She's a cable host on a TV show in 1989. So that's on Hulu coming October 23rd. I know that it'll be on your watch list. Um, Every day's a bad he, hair day for me. Uh, David Byrne, uh, American Utopia. I had tickets to see this show in New York uh, six months ago. 
and because of COVID, I uh, wasn't able to see it. They recorded the concert on Broadway with David Byrne, and that's going to appear on HBO. And then um, your favorite word, Al Yankovic, is doing a special called America is Doomed the Musical. <laughs> Does that sound like something you'll you'll want to watch? Perhaps. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he's always entertaining. So. Yeah, that's it. That's it. All right. So we've got folks uh, chiming in from around the country. You know, what's interesting, um, when we started, um, Rick Champagne from NVIDIA uh, said that he thought, you know, we'd have a couple thousand people that would want to tune in. And I think when that happened, we were very, very um, hesitant to, uh, to, to, to try to be too confident. But as of this morning, we've had over almost 1,950 people um, register and sign in for this series. And this is our third weekly show. Next Thursday is our last. But wow, what a terrific response. And uh, so great uh, that everybody is joining us. And we thank them for, uh, for signing up and signing in. Yes, thank you all for being here. You're probably inundated um, with online conferences these days, so we're grateful that you carved out time to come visit us. Yeah, between the online conferences and uh, and Zoom calls, uh, <laughs> people are spending a fair amount of their time staring at their laptop, right? Mm -hmm. There is a, uh, with the 28,000 layoffs at Disney this week, there is a letter that was written yesterday and published by American Theatre Magazine and it was written by a Matthew V. Erlbach. And it's about the new B and Arts Hero program. But it is a, uh, a letter to the world basically saying in New York City, uh, Broadway sold more tickets than all the New York's and New Jersey sports teams combined, creating revenue of $2 billion. Count for $30 billion of the Illinois um, economy a billion in Wyoming, in Nebraska, four billion in Iowa, seven billion in Utah, Indiana, nine billion in Arizona. Just how big a part of our GDP the arts fields are. And there was a story this morning that the National Association of Theater Owners is really, really sounding the alarm for the health of independent owned cinemas um, because of the ongoing implications of continued uh, shut down of movie theaters. So it's kind of an interesting time for people to take some stock at what the arts and entertainment mean to our economy. So true. Do you, uh, do you have any movies you're looking forward to? There's so many. Um, it's interesting because, uh, you know, there's so much content being produced or at least being released right now that's been produced recently that uh, there's more than I can keep track of at this point, which is interesting. It's also screener season for the Academy. I, I'm still behind. I've got 35. That's a good, okay. So the question is, how does the Academy have an Academy Awards? Are there enough screeners? Are there enough movies for the Academy to say, we're going to give out 26 Oscars this year? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think a, a question that remains to be answered. How do the Golden Globes get 1,200 celebrities into the ballroom at the Beverly Hilton for a dinner party and telecast? Exactly. I, 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 it just seems like the, the sorting all of this out is going to be such a huge, huge issue. So uh, Philadelphia is checking in. Hey, Philadelphia. Welcome. Thank you for, for joining us today. Uruguay is here. Welcome. Welcome. Um, virtual production in South America. Um, welcome to you all. Yes, thank you all for being here. Looks like so. Uh, go ahead. No, we're just going to get started here in a minute. All right. We will begin at eleven o'clock. We've got a, a great program today. So, uh, uh, thank you all for for uh, for joining us. Looking forward to it.
remote control. Stand by everybody. Remote control starts now. Good morning and welcome back. The COVID-19 virus has made it impossible for us to meet here in Hollywood for our, our fall conference. So with the help of our friends at Dell, NVIDIA, and Computer Graphics World, we're hosting these weekly 90-minute live programs to sort out the issues of working through these crazy times. We want to thank the team at Meetmo for giving us access to this amazing new platform for our program. Normally, here in Los Angeles, we would not have any guests from outside of Hollywood, but we've been completely surprised and thrilled that our weekly audiences here on this webcast have included so many people from outside of LA. It's amazing to have friends be able to join us from New York, Miami, Houston, Seattle, Vancouver, Toronto, Central America, Europe, and Asia. So welcome, everybody, and thank you for being here. Our goal here is to share some news look at some trailers and hear from speakers, all to help you stay connected to what's happening. Our mission is to support your success by keeping you informed about the creative process during COVID-19 and the tech that's empowering our industry's creative teams. Thank you in advance for your patience as we figure this out together. So let's get started. We have three discussions today. Gary Radburn will join us from Dell to discuss how creative pros are using tech to stay productive. We're also going to journey onto a virtual stage with Michael Mansouri of Radiant Images and Sam Nicholson from the American Society of Cinematographers. Every set in production has to adhere to new safety protocols. Rami Katrib is here with us uh, from Digital Film Tree today with Andrea Anacito Chavez. They're going to walk you through some safety plans so you'll have a front row seat of what's happening on production stages. Jim, what else do we have today? Well, Buzz, over the last couple of weeks, we've been asking our uh, viewers uh, for their thoughts about when movie theaters would be full again and running first run movies. Right now, about 70% of the U.S. cinemas are open, uh, but we're not at 100%, and uh, that's critical to the health of the cinema industry. We also were asking... Uh, when do you uh, anticipate uh, uh, returning to work? So we've got some results. And uh, the first question was, how soon do you think movie theaters will open with first run releases in all major U.S. markets, including New York and L.A.? 11% said by December 1st, 2020. Another 40% said by March 1st. So between those first two answers, 50% of the respondents basically think um, hopefully by the 1st of March. Um, and then 27% think as late as June and another 20% uh, after June of 2021. So uh, it's going to be this way for a while. How long do you anticipate working from home? 44% uh, said they think they'll be working from home through May of 2021, 26% through September of 2021. That's 70% right there of uh, the respondents saying, you know, it's a year away. 14% uh, December 2021, and 15% said June of 2022. So here is today's poll question. The poll just opened up. You'll find it right below the chat box. So look at the chat box. We'd love to get your feedback here. In thinking about returning to a traditional office setting, how many days each week do you think are ideal for productivity? One, in the office four to five days each week, two, in the office two to three days a week, three, in the office one day a week, and four, ideally, I'd work from home full time. So in thinking about returning to traditional office settings, how many days each week do you think are ideal for productivity? Please answer there below the chat box and we will have your results uh, later in the program. Now, one of the most important parts of going to the movies, as we were discussing, are the trailers. They're essential for the studios because they drive return attendance at movie theaters. Um, they're also uh, important marketing tools um, for uh, creating uh, buzz and creating event films. 
So we've got the new James Bond trailer for you. No Time to Die is his new movie. The word is he's turned down $100 million to do two more Bond movies. This is his fifth, and he says it's his absolutely last Bond movie. Co-stars Christoph Walsh as Blofeld, Rami Malek as the new Bond villain, and Ralph Fiennes as M. Billie Eilish sings the title song. Here is the newest trailer for Bond 25, No Time to Die. The past isn't dead. James, fate draws us back together. Now your enemy is my enemy. His name is Sefin. And what does he want? Revenge. Me. When her secret finds its way out, it'll be the death of you. You can imagine why I've come back to play. There's a young lady in Santiago I want you to meet. You're late. When you're ready. Salute. I met your new double O. She's a disarming young woman. I get why you shot him. Yeah, well, everyone tries at least once. James Bond. We both eradicate people. To make the world a better place. I just want to be a little tidier. Come on, Bond. Where the hell are you? Do you have a flow on this? Nope. to tell the good from bad, villains from heroes these days. What is it? I don't know what this is. He's going to kill millions. If we don't do this, there will be nothing left to save. was great two weeks ago we had a tour of a virtual stage with matt workman in boston that session is available on our youtube channel so please tune in and check it out today we're going to see tools being used in virtual stage settings with radiant images michael mansouri he is joined this morning by sam nicholson from the american society of cinematographers and the ceo of stargate this session is 25 minutes long Please put your questions in the chat box to the right of the screen as I'll be moderating a, a Q&A uh, as part of the panel and we'll work to answer as many questions as we can during the time. So thank you for being here and let's get started. Uh, I'm, I'm Michael Mentor, I'm co-founder of uh, Radiant Images as well as a new startup, Readmo. Radiant creates tools for virtualization. We create stages and, and methods to allow us to capture in volume, whether it's light field or volumetric, so that the environments can be virtualized and, and experience, whether it's for media entertainment or uh, learning and simulations. I'm Sam Nicholson, uh, and uh, I, I founded Stargate Studios, a visual effects house production facility here in Los Angeles and spread out to a lot of different places in Canada, Atlanta, Malta, Beijing. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of visual effects over the years and we've stepped very heavily uh, into virtual production uh, with our early work 
on shows like Pan Am and Beauty and the Beast and these things in, in green screen real time. And now we've moved very heavily into uh, virtual production using volumetric LED and a combination of traditional visual effects tools. That's fantastic. Uh, you guys have been at the cutting edge for quite some time, it sounds like. Um, can you both just give us an indication of how you got started on this path towards virtual production? Sure. I mean, for me, um, the path uh, was when I was, uh, ever since I could remember, uh, formulate any memory, uh, I had no choice. I was born into a, a crazy family of filmmakers. My mom and dad were filmmakers. My brother's a filmmaker. Ever since I could remember, um, I would remember um, falling asleep underneath my mom and dad's uh, foot as they're splicing uh, film. And um, the passion for exploring and, and creating solutions was because of the lack of resources. And the lack of resources always made us look towards what are possible to uh, fulfill the human's imagination and the spirit. And for me now, the, the motivation for everything that I'm doing is to fulfill uh, the, the wishes and dreams that my parents could no longer uh, fulfill. And my dream is to fulfill those and, and make, make the possibilities of uh, creating tool sets so that uh, our human imagination could, could go as far as it needs without the limitations of technology. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, interesting, Michael, when you talk about parents, uh, my, I was not born into the film business by any means. I, I didn't really even walk on a set till I was in graduate school at UCLA. Uh, Star Trek won the movie, but, and I had never intended on being in the film business. Uh, my father was an engineer, and, uh, but a designer of things like the first hydrofoils and deep submergence uh, for the Navy and whatnot. And but he was always, I was surrounded by, you know, astronauts and aquanauts and Jacques Cousteau and a lot of very interesting people that, you know, you, you find yourself sitting with Buzz Aldrin, who's walked on the moon, and Andy Regnitzer, who's been to the bottom of the ocean, Mariana's Trench at 14,000 feet down. And, you know, it's a very humbling experience as a kid, but you, you certainly say, well, that's kind of what I want to be when I grow up. And you know, the option for becoming an astronaut probably wasn't on the table, but in a, in a strange way, virtual production and visual effects is kind of imagining the impossible uh, and delivering that. So I've made a career out of that. Stargate is 30, almost 32 years old now, 1989. And it's been a heck of a ride. Every job is different. Every challenge is different. The technology is continually changing. And you're sort of riding this wild horse that I know you ride, Michael, uh, in terms of you make a lot of promises and then you go home and say, wow, how am I going to do that? And then you figure it out and you either live through it or you don't. And we, we obviously have had more successes than, than failures on those promises. You know, you know what I love about Sam is that, um, when he couldn't fulfill his dream as becoming an astronaut, uh, he's actually now in space. <laughs> and it's, it's yeah. incredibly hard to keep up. Like Sam and I have uh, this incredible love for, and, and respect for each other. And I consider Sam one of my mentors. Mm -hmm. um, but it's incredibly hard to keep up with Sam. You know, every time, you know, I try to outdo him, he's already in, uh, on another planet looking down on Earth. I'm here behind <laughs> the light field stage. I can never, I can never, I can never, I can never compete with Sam. Sam's well, Sam literally of his but own. I, but I do know that whenever I've got a, a technical challenge that seems impossible, like let's put together 150 cameras and synchronize them underwater, uh, <laughs> I can call Michael and and he'll make it happen. So whether it's in a jet or in a uh, underwater or you know we're we're faced with everybody's trying to you know go beyond essentially conceptually mm -hmm. artistically. And the tools are becoming so complex and, and accelerating at such a rapid pace, the software, uh, that, you know, as creators, can we keep up with it? So, so we need, I think, uh, an interpreter, essentially. It's like going to a foreign country 
every week and saying, well, I don't understand that language. You know, who knows Unreal, for instance? You know, who who is really good at C++ and who can write a plugin because I want to do this thing? Uh, we're, we're combining a lot of, of intersecting technologies right now in camera, in processing, in GPU rendering, uh, essentially software, video distribution, all of it. And, you know, even how we're presenting this show. So, you know, I think it, can our creative ambitions be connected with people that really understand the technology and can marry those two together to have a successful production at any scale, whether you're Mandalorian or you're a little independent uh, film, you know, how do you, how do you effectively use the tools on a scalable basis so that you're not locked out of virtual production if you've only got, you know, a hundred bucks, right? Mm -hmm. Can you do it? You know, can you, you can always spend more money and, and that's an easy thing, but I think the real creative application is, you know, a good DP can make a beautiful image with, you know, uh, this, a cell phone, right? It doesn't necessarily need, it's nice to have a beautiful big rig for, you know, behind the scenes pictures and stuff, but essentially art should take over in front of the, the technology should, what we try to do is make it become transparent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting yeah. you mentioned um, the creative and the technology is in almost equal measure because, you know, it, it's really, it's the marriage of those two things that makes all of this possible. And, and clearly there's more technology, I guess, involved now. But what I personally find fascinating, and I was hoping that you, you could maybe touch on this a little bit, is the fact that in, in early days of trying to do visual effects in film, it was as much in camera as possible, you know, based on whatever limitations the technology had. And then we started getting away from that into the point where a lot of it was just done in post-production and we, we got elements, we got ingredients on set, and then we didn't really know what the shot looked like till much later. And now we're kind of calling, coming full circle. Could you talk a little bit about that creative process, how it's influenced what you're doing with virtual production? I'll start and then I'll, I'll hand yeah. it off to Sam. I mean, yeah. I'm going to borrow this from uh, my other mentor, uh, Glenn Gaynor from Sony, he always would always say this. He would say the most expensive words a few years ago used to be what if. What if was very expensive. Now, what ifs are a lot more easier and more realistic because what if is, is just based on our imagination, what we can do and what we can't do. So from, from, from my perspective, I think that that's the most encouraging things that we could do now with where the technology is now. It's just bounding on, on our imagination. Where do we want to take it? How fast do we want to create this world? Look, look behind Sam. That's not green screen. That's real time, live pixel finish from glass to glass. So, and um, we could, we could experiment. That could be planet earth. And a few seconds later, we could be on, on the moon. So that's, that's the, the power that we get is now what if is not as expensive. Yeah, Michael, the, the two words that I, I probably wish that I could expunge from my vocabulary are no problem, <laughs> uh, right? Because everybody says, well, can we, after what if and can we do this, right? You find yourself as a visual effects supervisor saying, uh, yeah, we can do that, no problem, right? And then you think, oh, this is gonna be huge. Uh, and it sometimes it is, but but I, I I unfortunately have find myself saying no problem we'll make it work right and then you do figure out a way to do it. It may not be your initial way uh, that you think, but that you have to have a, a fantastic you know technology team to back you up to be able to deliver on the creative promise. So you know I think Buzz, what what do you really after with that question, tell me. Well, you know, it's it, it, especially in the days of green screen, for example, it took a lot of imagination for everybody on set to right. understand what that shot right. was going to look like. And we've right. come to the point now where that's no longer a question right. to even consider, you know, well, um, you know, I'm, what you're doing and sitting on an LED stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm old enough that, that I've got enough white hair that I can, I, and it, I've lived through it from the op days of optical printing and and yes, you're absolutely right. We did 
optical printing and, and chemistry was such a pain in the ass that, you know, very difficult. I mean, trying to line up mats in a, you go to dailies one day and the map for the earth is on one side and you bend the lens, you know, a thousandth of a degree, do it again. Tomorrow you look at it, the map's on the other side. It's like, you know, uh, color wedging. Anybody who lived through chemical, I, I really respect. Uh, so I did have the privilege of working with Albert, Albert Whitlock, for instance, who did, you know, latent image in-camera map paintings and stuff. And it was always magic to look through the lens and go, oh my God, that looks amazing. You know, half the image is on glass, the other half you're seeing through, and you're literally painting with Harrison Ellenshaw, another one that, that is incredibly talented, Peter Ellenshaw, legacy, you know, of, of in-camera. Uh, we did a lot of rear projection with the Hansard brothers and trying to, you know, you shoot 35 millimeter plates and then you put them in a projector and the projector is 50 feet away from a rear projection screen and everything synchronized, but it was in camera. And it's some beautiful stuff. You know, Albert Albert Hitchcock, right? right. The best at, at designing it. Now, it didn't have the best tools necessarily, but philosophically brilliant. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I did a lot on Star Trek um, the the thing was, you know, I was at graduate school at UCLA, and, I, and one of my professors said, you know, they're having a problem with the engine of the Enterprise, uh, and they want to try to do it live. Okay, so you go out and walk onto a soundstage for the first time and realize, you know, it's 60 feet high, big old set. And so we did, I was doing kinetic light at the time, so I, uh, so I designed these things called light guns that eventually found their way into Disney theme parks and all sorts of stuff. But we could kinetic light. I could blow glass, put light through it, and make it look like a matter antimatter reactor, uh, which looked pretty amazing. And and you know I had to get through the engineering part because you know the thing lit on fire the first day, and you know fire fire, they're rushing Bob Wise off the set. So we lived lived through the engine of the Enterprise, and. Uh, it worked well enough that Paramount said, you know, can you do the end of the movie? Can you do the Beecher sequence and and make the entire set disappear in light? And but it's got to be in camera because we've run out of post-production money. And they were between, uh, you know, visual effects supervisors, so they wanted everything in camera. And and we did achieve the majority of that in camera. So, you know, we put so much light on. Persis Kambata and Steve Collins that we put him in the hospital for a day with sunburn and snow blind. But other than that, it was a great effect. Uh, so, you know, then the digital era comes along and and everything starts going, you know, fix it in post, fix it in post, which is is wonderful because, you know, you throw up a green rag behind me and everybody goes to craft service and checks out and hey, you know, you'll, they'll fix it in post. Even from a DP, I've had DPs tell me, oh, you're going to change all the lighting anyway, you know? And you, <laughs> not that every green screen shoot is like that, because real-time green screen is very challenging. You have to have, you know, quite a bit of hardware on stage with six-stop tracking on all the cameras, and they're rendering BGs and all the lens dynamics have to be installed. And But you're still we still weren't able to get finished pixels on set. So from a business standpoint, you have to convince the producer to spend a whole bunch of extra money to see a beautiful pre-biz. And then you throw all that out and start over. And so financially, you're, it's, a, it's a loss. And so now what's happening with stepping forward again, we're actually going back to that initial philosophy of how much can you get in camera? Because if you have a thousand shots and you can take 750 of those and go, we're going to do those live, finished pixels on set. All of a sudden you have 25% the problem in post-production and you can actually focus on what is impossible to do as yet on LED. Mm -hmm. So now it's become a matter of balancing these tools. It is. Real-time LED is not a panacea. It's not doesn't solve everything. Green screen is still very, very viable and, and fantastic if you can put them together at the same time. That's kind of what we're working on right now with uh, our process through view, which is 
a combination of green screen and LED, foreground, background, alpha channel matting, all those things so you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. That's great. Well, thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit about the the Night Flyers uh, project and, and how sure, they came Sure, sure. I, I think we have um, I think we have some footage on it. Uh, it. Night Flyers was an early project that we did shot in Ireland for UCP. And the idea was to do a 70 foot wall of LED outside the front of this uh, spaceship. It's this television series. So there's a lot of material coming back to the the bridge. And it, so we, this is a relatively low res wall, um, which about P3. And we tested it in England and we did a, use the Unreal Engine to in real time render the earth and the extension of the ships. Uh, all those arms out there are an extension of, uh, when you see outside the ship, it's, it's all an extension. So set extension and earth, but we did a blind test of pre-baked images, pre-rendered, and a real-time render through the Unreal Engine. And blind test, everybody picked the Unreal Render, which is quite a surprise to us, because then we could change lighting and do collaborative editing, where if the director says, oh, I want to be a little further away from Earth at this point, or slow down the arms. OK, yeah, boom, it's, a, it's an engine. So I think that's really one of the most exciting areas right now is as you, you design something which looks beautiful, you get it to play back in Unreal at a particular speed, and then you have to get it into in-display with off-axis tracking, interactive lighting, and it changes a bit. So you just want to have a lot of testing up front, and you can balance these elements so that you can do real-time with collaborative editing through the Unreal Engine with off-axis tracking, outside-in, inside-out tracking, whatever. And, and you can really truly achieve finished pixels on set. And well, to your point, and this was for a TV show and normally it'd be unthinkable to have any kind of reasonable visual effects budget until a few years ago when the budgets of TV shows went up. But there's also the time equation too. On a TV series, they have to turn out series at a pretty regular cadence. And, and that's why I love the idea of virtual production become democratized to the point where people can use it for any application. Um, that would speed things up. And to your point, to solve the, the harder problems so you could save the impossible things for later. You know, as I, I love right. the visual effects expression, which probably it actually came from science, I believe, is that the impossible just takes longer. So let's give <laughs> the impossible that time it takes <laughs> to be done. And yeah. let's just get those things that don't matter. I, I love to say, my wife is a producer uh, for many years. And uh, as we like to say, what's wrong with making a decision? What's wrong with getting it in camera? <laughs> right. You know, so we can move on to right. the harder problems. Um, now, can you talk a little bit about how the, the, how the fix it in post uh, mantra has changed due to virtual production. I'm sure there's some some gotchas in there that need to be fixed, but but how does it change that notion other than the obvious of just getting the pixels uh, and moving on? Right. Well, you know, fix it in post became the mantra in in heavy green screen because you really can fix it in post, generally speaking. The the mantra has changed because if you're going to do virtual production, you have to have all of that, those decisions, as you say, Buzz, have to be put up front. You have to know what your dystopian city looks like. You have to know what the billboards are going to be. You have to have all your graphics in place. There's a tremendous amount of work that, that has to be pre-produced and tested and be ready when you walk on set. That given, uh, say you get all this stuff perfect, you still have all these technical things like, it, does your screen more aid? Do you shoot off the screen? Does the director suddenly say, you know, I want to do a straight up shot. Um, I want to jump off the train into the screen, for instance. Um, and suddenly you find yourself saying, well, maybe we should go to green here. Maybe we should. So one of the most important things that is a serious gotcha is when you do something like this, There, I have no alpha channel. There is no... If you want to change that Earth behind me and make it Mars, you're going to be rotoscoping. There is no map, which you do have in green screen for everything. So, you know, when the colorist says, well, I want an alpha channel on everything, you're not going to have it. So you have to 
have the color controls, we use uh, multiple DaVinci Resolves on set. Uh, it's a fantastic tool, the DaVinci. And a lot of the Blackmagic uh, product for you know 8K quad splitting, very affordable. It's really high quality. And I'll, I'll tell you that, that it can build a pipeline on stage that you have full color control of the, the black levels of the space behind me. If they're not right and you want to adjust them in the post, you have no alpha channel yet. We're working on it, uh, mm -hmm. depth matting and whatnot. But as yet, you know, we're kind of in between real real time LED work, volumetric work is really an emerging wild west right now. There are very few rules. And so our approach is much more of a scalable uh, uh, modular approach that, mm -hmm. so we can scale it to fit the production. So if you're a small production, you have a small screen, you might even have OLEDs. Uh, you know, on run, we, for HBO, we decided to go with OLED monitors outside the train rather than LEDs because it, it saved them about a million dollars. And it, we got more pixels of 4K outside every window. Uh, instead of a little piece of an LED screen. So each solution is different. That's great. Thank you. And, and, and speaking of, um, uh, of some of the earlier uh, publicly available clips to look at, could you talk a little bit about the, the genesis of the motorcycle clip? Uh, I think oh, sure. I'm going to have yeah. any view that has, but it, it's, I'm, I'm probably in there at least a half a million times myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, you know, as a, as a DP, I can design the setup, right? And if you got a, just a motorcycle, I really don't want a low res screen that is built to build a, a, a giant spaceship out there or something, right? This is just a girl on a motorcycle. And the challenge was to build Neo Tokyo. This is a 3D background. So we, we do have great traditional visual effects artists. So we built Neo Tokyo in two weeks. Uh, to, as a game would be for speed, right? So not for resolution, for speed. And then we designed these kinetic lights to be able to shoot light into the lens. So as lights are coming towards the lens, you're seeing them flare before they hit the image plane, just like a normal street light would do. And the screens are all on wheels, which is how we generally do them and we roll them. This is a P1.2 screen at high frequency because we're gonna be shaking the camera and doing a bunch of crazy stuff. And so you don't want tearing, you don't want any artifacts in there. And in fact, what the way I shot it, I wanted to shoot it, everything, everything you wouldn't do on green screen, foreground flares, motion blur, shaky cam, you know, uh, shallow depth of field, perfectly synchronized interactive light. And when you get all those things going, it's it's almost like a, a different experience. And I could give the director, Taiko Watiti, uh, a camera and he could shoot right there. I mean, it's just boom, he just walked on and you can see it and you can block it. So it's, it's a tremendously powerful tool for directors and for actors and for DPs. Mm -hmm. Because you can block it, you can see it. The actors know where their eye lines are. The interactive lights. You're you're discovering things that are magic on set, as opposed to hoping that it's going to work in a couple of weeks. Exactly, and hoping you have enough time to actually do its service. In post. Yeah, and and by the way, for editors, we on in one day we shot four hours of usable material in 8K, two reds. Um, everything comped in 8k and finished done and so when we give it to the editors they're throwing out more material than they're using i mean it's like it's like it's real you know it the if you don't like take one take two take three take four take 12 they're all finished and and i think that's from an editorial standpoint where virtual production truly excels is in coverage the longer the lens the friendlier it gets and so dialogue is, is where you edit, re-edit, change, screen, change again, change again. The big establishing shots that are eye-watering, visual effects, green screen, whatever they are, they're isolated. You, you know, you're not gonna, 
actually Al, Al Whitlock uh, told me that if they didn't guarantee that one of his shots was going to be in the movie, that he wouldn't do it because mm -hmm. he didn't want to spend 40 days on a matte painting and then have it hit the cutting room floor. Exactly. So I, I think it's a pluses and minuses, but it's a very powerful new uh, tool in the toolkit of visual effects. No, I think it's amazing. And that's a masterful use of the technology. So thank you for doing that. Uh, I do have a question here from the chat. I was wondering if you could uh, chime in on, which sure. is about uh, whether you're using time of flight technology uh, at all in um, anything that you're doing currently. Well, uh, Michael is is kind of Mr. Time of Flight. Um, he, he is indeed. <laughs> he does a lot. And, and we have done some great stuff with uh, using using time of flight, particularly in terms of kind of 2.5D, 3D implementation. You know, where is all this going? I think multi-camera uh, and I thought that the Lytro uh, yeah. cameras were incredible, but incredibly impractical as well. You know, Dave Stump's <laughs> a very good friend and, you know, I went up, I thought what they shot was beautiful, but wow, the camera was eight feet long and 800 pounds. So, you know, time of flight is there. I think there, Intel is working on a number of other really interesting technologies. Michael, to to talk about um, your work with the Sony RX Zero has been fantastic. Yeah. We've done a lot of it together. Actually, um, why don't we play that clip? Because this is how Sam and I always get in trouble. Like we come up with these crazy ideas. Sony came to us back in 2018 and we pitched them on uh, capturing light field with the Sony RX Zeros. And just because we weren't 100% confident that the uh, RX Zeros would be able to you know, generate a light field, I also pitched them on, hey, why don't we do bullet time, but let's do it underwater. In a sense, you know, bullet time is a sense of a volumetrical light field capture. We're, we're seeing it from multiple views. So we did this wacky, crazy idea of taking 100 cameras and sink it underwater. So let's let's watch that. This is from the Meridian. This is in my pool at uh, at, at my house. We we <laughs> dropped a uh, black duvetine in, and then had a, a girl who could hold her breath remarkably long, and we put uh, what was it 120 Michael uh, yeah. RX zeros underwater. Yep. And and did bullet time. There's a bullet time. That's that's moving through 120 cameras synchronized underwater. And it know. was actually the second hardest thing I've ever done in my life because we had to take all these cameras and put them underwater, come back, couldn't see. And uh, well, luckily we got all the cameras back except we lost one. But uh, for 2018 for Sony, we were actually able to give them both the light field portable solution. Uh, which was highly inspired by your work, Buzz, at Lytro. When when I first saw Lightfield, the stuff that you guys did, I was in awe because everything I've seen from volumetric is great. But Lightfield to me is is the cinematic approach towards it. It, it renders harsh lighting. It's, uh, it renders just incredible detail. Um, it was also a little bit impractical because the cameras were very expensive. Yeah. So that's why we decided to go with consumer grade cameras and synchronize them. And now we're doing a lot of things with these incredible cameras. We're doing light field, volumetric and bullet time. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, we could all talk about this forever uh, and I would love to, uh, but it looks like we're out of time for this particular session. But I do wanna thank you both for, not only for being here today, that is huge, but also just for how you're advancing the industry. That is enormous. That's uh, one of those priceless moments that we, we talk about. So thank you both for really pushing the ball forward and also making this a technology that's approachable to people. I think that, you know, we're just trying to create great stories and, and you are at the forefront of that. So thank you both. Well, Buzz, also thank you for, you know, uh, we, we're all standing on shoulders, right? We're standing on, on great giant shoulders. And I also want to say thank you for leading the way towards a lot of the advancements that you've done. It's very inspiring. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very, very much for the opportunity. Yeah. Let's do this again. <laughs> okay. Look forward to it. Well, thank you both. Um, thank you.
And uh, next up, um, Jim is uh, going to give us another uh, trailer preview here. You know, we've been talking about um, uh, some of the exciting things that are happening this year and, uh, you know, with production the way it's going. Uh, animation, luckily, is continuing full speed ahead. So, Jim, would you like to introduce our next clip? Yes, but I've been watching the comments in the chat box and uh, people uh, are saying you guys are rock stars. So thank you for that. That is really fantastic. And people have been asking, where can we watch this? Uh, is it recorded and can we watch it later? And the answer is yes and yes. You can watch it on our YouTube channel and that address is also in the chat box. Um, some more welcomes this morning, Sonoma. Uh, Steamboat Springs, Colorado, uh, I hate you. <laughs> What a great place to be and chiming in. So it's 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 uh, great to see so many towns and uh, pros uh, uh, joining us this morning. It's great to have each and every one of you. Now, if you're the team at Pixar We're out, right? and you've got a motion picture that was due out this summer, but your workforce is situated all across Northern California, what do you do? Well, they had 1,200 people working on their latest film, Soul, from home. And uh, they shared more uh, detail with the working uh, teams on this yeah. film than they normally do to cover plot points that might normally be uh, kept back until the, the final version is uh, pulled together. Uh, but in order to get everybody on the same page, they shared, they communicated, and with uh, 1,200 people working from home, uh, Soul is scheduled to be released in November. Uh, the question is, will it be in movie theaters as originally planned? Will we see it possibly on Disney Plus? Uh, we're not sure. But in light of the huge hits of Coco, Inside Out, and all of the other major films from Pixar, this is their 24th uh, uh, in the series. Let's take a look at Soul. <laughs> What the? What is this place? What's your name, honey? Uh, I'm Joe. I teach middle school band. Got it, go for it! Today started out as the best day of my life. Back here tonight, first show's at seven. Yes! Woohoo! You know what that's gonna say? Joe Gardner! <laughs> Must have been sudden for you. Whoa! Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Help! I'm not done! Oh my, oh my goodness! Huh? Is this heaven? No. It's the great before. This is where new souls get their personalities, quirks, and interest before they go to Earth. Meet 22. I don't want to go to Earth. Stop fighting this. I don't want to. Uh. <laughs> oh, hey, look, I already know everything about Earth, and I don't want anything to do with it. You're missing out on the joys of life, like uh, pizza. I can't smell. We can't, we can't taste either? All that stuff is in your body. No smell, no taste. Or touch. See? Okay, I get it. Wow. It's my life. Is all this living really worth dying for? You're still alive? Can you help me get back? No way! There I am. What are we waiting for? Wait, not me! This weird. What is it? 151,000 souls go into the great beyond every day, and I count every single one of them. The count's off. Huh. That was great. Can't wait to see it. Yeah. Thank you to our friends at Pixar. Uh, so we now have the results of our poll question. Uh, the question was, how many days each week do you think are ideal for productivity in terms of going to the office? So 12% uh, of you thought four to five days. So basically in the office every day. Uh, let's see, 15% thought one day a week would be the appropriate amount. 28% uh, said they would like to work from home full time. 
And 43% of the folks that responded to the poll said that they would prefer to be in the office two to three days a week. And that's interesting because that very much coincides with the pattern I had pre-COVID going to the office. And it was mostly just based on my own productivity. So thank you all for chiming in uh, on the poll. Appreciate it. Now, when we have showcased creative work here, many of the questions we have center on what equipment is being deployed to work through this period. So we asked Gary Radburn to chime in from his home in North Carolina. He's here to talk about how to remain effective in what he calls the next normal. He serves as director of virtually everything at Dell, and he's on the board of the Advanced Imaging Society, and we're happy that he is. Please, let's get started. Gary Radburn. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for being here today. I'm very excited to be able to present some things to you, which hopefully will help you in these, how should we say, strange times that we find ourselves in. So my name's Gary Radburn. I'm from Dell Technologies, and I'm the director of virtual, or virtual augmented reality and virtualization. So I like to abbreviate that down to the director of virtually everything. Uh, as you can see, it's a beautiful day here in North Carolina. I've um, secluded myself up in the mountains uh, away from it all. But without further ado, let's go through some of the presentation. So we're going to talk about business continuity. Uh, how do you actually maintain work in the workplace when you're not at the workplace? So we're going through this where everybody's now trying to work from home. But generally, when you've been working with big workstations, some specialist equipment, then you don't really have that at home. So how do you operate in this, what I like to call the next normal? Uh, we'll go through a few examples of what we can do to actually help you use that equipment more effectively. Uh, we'll go through some ideas of augmented and virtual reality and how that's aiding in knowledge transfer, et cetera. And then we'll go through some virtualization, how we can make better use of our resources that are back in the office inside of the data center. And then we'll finish it all off with where do I see technology actually going in the future and bringing in a little bit of uh, 5G touching on there as well. So with that, I'm driving the slides here. We're currently in a changing time. Um, we're now at home, and we had four distinct stages that I've seen IT go through to actually get equipment back into people's hands. Because what originally happened in phase one, phase one actually started with people just grabbing everything they could possibly get their hands on and then take it home. So you put all the big equipment into the car, you take it back, you then put it into the house, your flat, your apartment, whatever, then you power it all on. Now you're looking at it thinking, well, this looked a lot smaller when it was back in the office because you had a desk space there, you had an open plan office probably, so you could all interact with each other. And now you've got this big workstation back in the home, it's looking bigger than it ever did. It's also not fitting in with the home environment. You've got little Johnny, little Sarah running around the apartment. Uh, they've got their beverage of choice in hand, tripping over power cables, falling over the machine, pouring liquid where liquid shouldn't go. And now you've got a situation where you need to do a service call to get things fixed, but you can't get people round because you're social distancing. So you can't get people into the house. So stage one really didn't last too long. We then move on to stage two, which is how do we eliminate the space that we're now taking up inside of the uh, apartment or house? And that's where we start to move to more of a mobile platform. Mobile platforms really are more portable now. They're the same power that we had uh, inside of workstations. I mean, if you've got a specialist rig where you've got dual GPUs inside of it, or you've got extra CPU power inside, then yes, you're still going to need that big tower workstation. But mobile workstations have really grown up now in terms of power and usability. And so we're now starting to see a lot of people moving towards that mobile workstation. It allows you to have your data on the go. 
it allows you to put it away at the end of the day so that when you want to spend family time and put work away for an evening, you can actually just close it up, put it in a cupboard, and it's well out the way. We don't have that problem there of size and space. However, you do have one other issue, which people tend to think of as a, as a last thing after they've gone through stage one and stage two. And that's that. how do you protect your data now? Because what's been happening, even with the mobile platform and even with the fixed platform that you may have taken home, then you've still got to get the data to that machine to be able to work on it. Now, if you're working on your latest opus for your studio or whatever else, you don't want to copy all of those assets onto a USB drive and then take those home. Similarly, you don't want to pull them across the internet and then save them locally. Even if you're using a VPN for security, it's only as secure as the end user. So they go and copy it down. They then work on it locally. They might make a copy and put it onto their network attached storage at home for safekeeping. They might put it onto an external USB because they're working on several machines around the house. Once you start losing control of that data, if that data gets outside onto the big wide world, you're not going to get that back. Right? And there have been instances where data leakage has happened and designs for the future have actually been leaked and lost. And what happens is that's the business of your endeavors for the foreseeable future. So there is definitely a fiscal risk associated with that. So you've already returned those big machines to the office and you've now got your mobile machine in your home. What can we do to actually get to the next stage? So we get to stage three, which is where we can now remote those devices. By remoting, I mean that we can now take the mobile platform that we've got at home, we can take the workstation that we've actually got back in the office, and we can connect the two of those together, but we're only gonna use the mobile device, the mobile workstation, as a view into the workstation back in the office. Now, there are different things and different techniques available, like you know, remote display protocol from Microsoft, but they're not generally geared towards the big applications that we use in workstations, in creativity, uh, where we're leveraging things like OpenGL and whatever else inside of the applications. Uh, it's not robust enough to do that. So we have to think of a way of doing that, and I'll show you that as an example in a moment. But what we're doing now is we're remoting pixels. So by remoting pixels, we're not sending any data across the network. We're actually just sending those pixels. Any pixels that change, we're not sending it like a 24 frame per second movie or whatever else. We're actually only sending the pixels that change on the network across to your local device. So there's no actual physical uh, model data or physical data from your network that's passing, it's pure pixels. And that's gonna be encoded on the network as well for security. So now you can see that we don't have to copy files, version control is a lot easier because we're actually using the workstation as if we were still in the office. The next stage is gonna be stage four. Stage four is like, well, why have I got workstations under desks in offices when I've got nobody sitting at those desks? Is there a better way or a better location I could put those workstations for more effective use of my resource? What you do there is you then take that workstation and you relocate it to the data center. The data center is the most secure location inside of your organization. It was before this situation and it still is. If it's not the most secure place in your organization, then you know, tune into another presentation where I can tell you about data center security, but I'm not gonna cover that here today. Once they're in the, in the data center, you've now got the advantage that you've got faster links inside of the data center. Generally, when you're working on movies, et cetera, doing dailies, there's a lot of information that needs to go backwards and forwards to your machines. If you were doing that across the pieces of wet string that we call a network inside of your office, or even worse, across the general purpose internet, where everybody else is also trying to use that bandwidth to work from home, it can take a prohibitively long time to download all of that data or work on it. Now that you've got it in the data center, co-located with your data stores, you can actually download that data over 10 gig or faster links between your workstation and your data storage, which actually increases productivity. Uh, just as an aside, as a, as a little stat, we're actually seeing feedback from uh, the media and entertainment industry 
where everybody was against work from home. If I couldn't see you, you weren't being productive. Uh, presenteeism was rife. But we've really fast forwarded about five years because working from home was becoming more and more predominant, uh, but it still wasn't mainstream. Now, obviously, it's mainstream. People have had to embrace it. And the fear about people being at home and not focused on their work tasks has now generally become a thing of the past because they're finding, uh, especially with artists and things like that, they're doing faster work and they're doing better quality work because they don't have all of that destruction, uh, destruction, distraction that they had inside of the office and so therefore are more focused on the work they actually have to do. Uh, by that, they're actually focused, they deliver it faster, they deliver better quality. And as a flip side, they actually have a better quality of life as well in return because by doing it faster, they may be able to break earlier. Um, they're actually in their home environment, so they might be able to spend time with uh, family members during the day that they wouldn't have been able to if they were in the office. So there's a real payback for that. And we're seeing that in, in as I say, better productivity and uh, better quality of work that's going through. And then the last one is that the software that we were using was always licensed to a machine or licensed to a user, generally to more of to a machine at that point. Now, when we virtualize, the software vendors were very reticent to actually open up their licensing to that type of endeavor. Uh, now, with the situation that we all find ourselves in, people have to be a bit more uh, accommodating in what they're doing for their end users. And in that way, we're now seeing the ISVs, the independent software vendors, actually licensing their software more in a virtualized environment and actually endorsing a particular virtualized environment for running that. And we'll see what impact that has as we move a bit more through the presentation. So if I just move to the next slide, then we're going to be remoting. So I mentioned it before about passing the pixels to the end device. Let's see how that actually works in practice. So here's a diagram. And it shows what we have inside of a data center. Now, here I've shown two of our rack products. I don't want to turn this into an advertisement for Dell products, but we have two rack workstations which can sit inside of the data center. And this is equally applicable to a tower workstation that you might have had as well. Uh, we've had a very good working relationship with a company called Teradici since about, what, 2007, I think it is now. Uh, and it originally started off with a hardware card that you put inside of the workstation. You then connect the graphics output of your workstation, and you put that into the Teradici card. That then encodes it that then secures it and then throws the pixels out over the network in a compressed format. At the other end, we can have a, uh, a zero client, which is a self-contained firmware device, no attack vectors for viruses. So very suitable for home use inside of that because you're not going to be loading software onto it. Uh, for particular viruses, et cetera, there. So it's a standalone device, and we can run two or four displays on it, depending on which flavor you actually have. Uh, I'll go on to the soft client in a minute in the next slide, but the advantage here is that it takes no host resources. Because it's a hardware card that fits into the Rack workstation, then you're not really going to be taking up any CPU cycles inside of there. You're going to be encoding on the fly, and it's going to give you all of your CPU cycles for the applications that you're actually running. The downside is the resolution that you can actually get out of that. It goes up to 2560 by 1600 resolution for dual screens uh, on the two port model. So it's giving you a lot of real estate and two screens, two monitors is great at that resolution. The advantage of it is that you can actually reboot it remotely. So imagine you're doing a lot of hard work, uh, even if you're doing coding or whatever else, perhaps, then you have a machine lockup. Uh, unfortunately, because the machine is now not local to you, the only way to reboot that machine would be to get an IT person to go in there with a, a finger to then go and hit the reset button for you. 
that's going to be a support call. It's going to take you out the zone. It's going to potentially be a couple of hours at least of downtime for the, the creative at the other end, and time is money quite literally. So what we can do here is we can actually put what we call the flea power card inside of the tower workstation or rack workstation, and then we can reboot it remotely by using the power button that we have locally. That will then reboot the machine as if I was going there, turning it off and on again. So that's an advantage of a hardware type solution. In a software solution, then we actually have the software host. This is now software which loads onto the workstation, the rack or the tower, and this can now do up to 4K resolution. Right, so Teradici have now taken their hardware card that they had, they've now developed it, they've multi-threaded it, so that you're now taking a small slice of the CPU rather than an entire core, um, which happened in the, the old days, and by old days was a couple of years ago. Um, but the software host now sits on that workstation and encodes the pixels in real time. It looks at the frame buffer and then puts out those pixels. Again, no data is transferred. It's all about transferring the pixels that change. And now we can do up to quad displays with 4K resolutions. Now, being in media entertainment, 4K is quite a big deal. Uh, a lot of the uh, information is being shot at 4K and above. You can now edit more in a raw format. You can see things in the way they were intended. Or you can do at a lower resolution and perhaps all of, have all of your tools available inside of the extra screen real estate that you actually have. So it's a far more efficient way of working inside of that 4K. Now, there are some caveats that the hardware decoding at the other end, that will only decode up to 2560 by 1600. But if you have a software client that's running on the workstation or the mobile device that I mentioned earlier, you can actually then decode that stream at 4K using that software client as long as you support AVX2 extensions in the chipset, which is basically any chipset that's occurred in the last few years. So if you've got a relatively model modern end device, you'll then be able to run 4K resolutions and workloads using this type of technology. So I'm going to switch gears now and move into VR and AR. Uh, it's been a big passion of mine, been doing VR and AR now for quite a long time. If you've caught me at uh, some other AIS presentations before, I've done a few keynotes on this in the past. Uh, but VR and AR is still going strong. Uh, we're still seeing new uh, revolutionary ideas that are happening. We're seeing uh, the screen real estate going up, the fidelity, the screen door effect now disappearing, becoming less intrusive, and some great new technologies like eye tracking that's now coming into headsets to be able to see where people are looking for those micro expressions that we crave in avatars because we're all human beings. We like getting together at the moment. We can't get together outside of our social bubbles. So now getting together inside avatars where you can see eye movement actually gives you some more of that micro expression that we want as human beings. So in terms of VR AR, why is that important? Because VR AR conveys a lot of information in a very short space. A picture paints a 1,000 words, VR paints 100,000. Uh, those of you who have worked in the industry have created pieces in VR and AR, and I know there's a lot of you out there, and there's been some great stuff that's really been driving media and entertainment uh, up and you know, for the, in the past and now. What's actually happening is that that media and entertainment expertise is now going through into other verticals. By verticals, I mean the other industries. So here we can actually see the different verticals of oil and gas, healthcare, education, engineering, manufacturing, and I'm putting training in all of those because we want to convey ideas. We want to get people with experiential learning. Uh, On-the-job training, vocational training was all about standing over somebody's shoulder and showing them what to do in a real-life environment. We can't do that now. But VR is about the next best thing. Training, training being done inside of VR. A trainer. I mean, when I was uh, when I was a kid, many many moons ago, I remember the language labs. 
the language labs was where you had a set of headphones on, you were doing French or German or Latin inside of there, and you were repeating back phrases with the correct accents and words, etc. And then the teacher at the front would actually tune into you, unbeknownst to you, and then correct you on the fly with a mysterious voice in your head. Uh, in much the same way, we can do that now in VR. You've now got somebody in a training exercise inside of VR. We can offer coaching just through audio, or we can have an instructor avatar inside of that VR experience as well, coaching you through that. So training has become very, very big. And it's the advances that's happened in media and entertainment that have really driven that quality and that immersion that we're now seeing in training for other verticals as well. But as in a deeper look of VR training, then this slide makes me realize how futile my life really is. Because if we look at the top of the pyramid, then the audiovisual, the reading, the lectures, you're only taking in up to about 20% of what I'm actually telling you over this session today. That's really depressing for me. VR, on the other hand, delivers up to 75% retention because you're now experiencing it. You have an emotional connection to the content. They've seen in retail that VR and AR is really starting to get people having an emotional connection to the product, and then that increases upsells in things like automotive industry because you couldn't see what it looked like when you were choosing from a catalog, and it's a high-value ticket item. If you can now see those changes in the object in real time when you're picking it from a catalog and you can see those changes in VR and you can get the family involved as well so everybody can see it, then everybody is going to be far more comfortable with making a purchase decision than they were previously. So VR has really helped to drive the adoption of training there. We also see uh, the training happening inside the medical industry. Now, I could do some media and entertainment examples, but I'd rather focus on the healthcare aspects because I think they're more life-changing. The medical industry, we're now starting to see VR and AR really get a connection to the patients, to the doctors, to give more successful outcomes of operations in there. And we partner through our technical um, partner program with some of the leaders in the industry. So we like to bring, if a customer comes in with an issue, we can then partner up a partner with Dell, with the customer, to actually give you the best resource possible and the quickest time to a project. So here's an example inside of uh, Medical Holodeck. There's a, a video that's uh, running there. I'll just uh, take myself out the frame. Um, but Medical Holodeck allows you to train up people, but also to bring in MRI scans. So you can actually see the patient's MRI scan, not a patient. What does that do for you? That allows you to actually plan operations, to actually train people up on real life situations from real life MRI scans inside of there. And you can see the sections, take sections through it all inside of real time. So we're seeing a lot more effective medical training happening without having to go through the expense of you know, I don't know, having bodies inside of a, a medical training. You can actually now just do it inside of VR a lot more quickly a lot more effectively and also remotely. If you send a headset and the application out to the end user, that end user can train themselves up very, very quickly. And whilst we might not work in healthcare, we all care about our health. So this hopefully helps the ideas resonate with, with you out there in the big wide world. We've also done things in terms of training applications. Uh, in the old days, again, probably four years ago, it used to take a film budget to create any training inside of VR. You had to create all of your assets from scratch. You had to create the programming from, from scratch. Over that last four years, then companies like Induvo have actually done more of a drag and drop type approach to training to allow people to create their own training experiences far more effectively. And by doing that, we can actually drop in PDFs, we can drop in models, and we can have discussions inside of that. We can all be inside the same room. The great thing is about training inside of VR is that at the moment, I'm talking to you through a camera. I've got no feedback in audience land of whether you're listening to me, feeding the cat, uh, going off, doing email, whatever else, and whether I've just got half an ear. 
inside of training inside of VR, you know whether somebody is present and correct inside of there. If they've got the headset on, their avatar will appear inside of that simulation. If they put the headset on top of their head so that it covers the sensor, you're going to see them looking permanently up all the time. And if you're using eye tracking, you're not going to see their eyes move either because they're permanently looking upwards. And if they remove the headset completely, so the sensors for the headset uh, say there's nobody in the headset, then their avatar disappears. So now you've got 100% engagement, both audio and visual inside of these training sessions, which then lends themselves to that 75% figure that we saw earlier. We then move into AR. So AR, uh, we work with a company called uh, Mediviz, and they're now starting to take things like the Microsoft HoloLens, take those MRI scans that we mentioned earlier, and anchor those to a patient in real life. Uh, it's then connected in the background to like the Dell Canvas and a Dell workstation where uh, somebody, a technician, is looking at those screens and then guiding the surgeon through and perhaps pointing out things that the surgeon might not notice. You can also take different layers inside of that so the surgeon can actually plan their route to the operation before they even make the first incision. So they can actually see what's going on there overlaid on top of the patient itself. It makes for a far better operation because you actually can see what you're going to be able to do. Uh, hopefully have a far better outcome of the operation. And at the end of the day, that's what the doctor and the patient both want, right? We want a successful outcome for everybody inside of this. And VR and AR are really upping the game, uh, pun intended in terms of the gamification of these training applications to really pass those real life skills on to make everybody more successful in what they do through muscle memory, repetition, and not putting people in harm's way. There's also different ways to interact with your customers. Now that you can't do trade shows, I mean, here we are, we're doing the remote control sessions here, would have probably been done in an auditorium, everybody in seats, and we'd had a great time there. Unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of that now, but there are other platforms where we can now do this inside of VR. We partner very strongly with HTC uh, of the Vive headsets, and they've just launched their platform into open beta uh, for Sync, S-Y-N-C. So check it out if you have a chance. Inside of there, I can invite people into a conference room. It's a VR room. I can put a table in there. I can have a big screen display with PDFs, with PowerPoints. I can bring models in from popular applications and put those in the middle of the table. And I can annotate those as well as we all discuss in real time inside of the VR environment. If I want more of a presentation environment, I can have auditorium seating. And we can sit those VR avatars inside of there. Now, that's all, all very well, but the great thing about this is one of the main drawbacks of VR for training in a group environment. Uh, we saw this a few years back when we did the launch of the Jaguar Land Rover, uh, the iPACE. Uh, we had all the journalists in the room. It wasn't done through PowerPoint. It was all done through VR headsets. We had engineers inside of the headset discussing the features of the car all the way through it. But the feedback was that how do you take notes when you've got a VR headset on? Right? It doesn't feel natural. You've got to bring yourself out of the experience. You then got to make your notes, and then you put the headset back on. With Sync, they've got a roundup by everybody has a VR tablet inside of the experience. And inside of that, there's a dictation button. I can do a speech to text. I can press the button. It mutes my microphone from everyone else. And then when I speak, it's actually going to then translate what I'm saying and make notes for me. So I'm now still in the VR experience. I'm still hearing what's going on while I'm making notes, but nobody else can hear me taking those notes. And then afterwards, it will do speech to text, and then you can save those down and put those into the application of your choice for uh, memories of the future. Right? So if you want to put it into a document, I can just download it as text and then put that into a document afterwards. Very, very powerful features that are now getting around some of the limitations that people had over VR and AR adoption because we're constantly progressing. Things are always getting better. And in current situations, we still want to have some sort of interaction. And VR is becoming more and more popular in interactions for people from home. So now I'll just touch briefly on the virtualization aspect. In terms of this, we're going to be looking at 
how do we get multiple users onto a single workstation? I, I can put multiple GPUs, right? So if I took the NVIDIA cards, for instance, the RTX cards, uh, Quadro, I could then put four single wide cards inside of a workstation that's in the rack. Now, by doing that, I've now increased the density of the number of users. Now, imagine the situation. You were in the office and you were a manager, but you didn't have your own workstation because you were only signing off on designs. You were signing off on dailies and drawings, but you weren't needing the power of a workstation for your day-to-day -day tasks. So what you would do is you'd wait for John or Sarah to go to lunch, and then you'd ask if you could borrow their workstation, and then you'd go and sign off on the drawings or whatever while they were at lunch, right? It allowed you that interactive use and sharing of workstation resource. Obviously, with social distancing now and people being based at home, we don't have the luxury of doing that. And I might not want to buy everybody a workstation for home use if all they're doing is a couple of hours a week. It doesn't make sense. So this isn't in any shape or form to replace workstations or to replace physical workstations. It really is to augment workstations, to increase the reach of workstations to people who might otherwise not have had them. By putting four GPUs in there, I can split those out into four what we call virtual machines. Each virtual machine will have its own dedicated GPU, just like they would if it was a dedicated hardware resource under a desk. I can then also dedicate CPU resource to each one of those virtual machines. Now, we have a tool where you can actually profile a user to see how much memory they're using, how much CPU they're using, how much graphics power they're using, so that we can size this appropriately. But if you give a user their own CPU, their own GPU, and now I've got four users per rack workstation, I've now made far more efficient of my resource inside of this. The other thing is that a lot of you out there are rendering uh, big jobs overnight. You use a lot of CPU resource. You're using your favorite CPU renderer. Uh, with this, we can actually now start getting 24-7 operation of the hardware that we've actually paid for that might be sitting idle if it was at a home or if it was at an office. But now being in the data center, if we're using everybody in, say, North America, uh, we've got that three-hour time window, then overnight there's going to be a window of opportunity where that workstation isn't being used by anybody because people are asleep, hopefully. Then we can take that and we can repurpose that through virtualization by pointing it to a different image to now become a rendering farm, right? So it now forms part of a rendering farm or does rendering on its own through that reappropriation and rebooting it into that virtual machine image. Very, very easy step. And then come the following morning, we could then have the users logging back in because we've now switched it back over to virtual machines. And they can then see what's been rendered overnight to then work on it for their working day. So it makes a very, very much more efficient use of resources. Then if uh, software licensing allows, you can also do a follow the sun type approach. So if you're doing a handover, because these are centrally located inside of your data center, you can actually have users that aren't necessarily geographically located in the same place. You can actually have them working remotely. And because we're using the same technology that I went through earlier from Teradici, we're running a software host inside each one of these. We're now just transmitting those pixels across the internet to the user at home, wherever that user may be located. So they're now becoming more efficient. We can then do handovers to different teams. So if somebody's doing shading, somebody's doing coloring, somebody's doing drawing, we can actually do those to the different departments and use that follow the sun type approach from the resources we have here. So again, hopefully you're seeing that we're now using far more effective use of our hardware across the globe. And then the other thing, that I just want to touch on is when we start doing multiple headsets with a single workstation. So what we're doing here is the world is a changing place. Uh, we're going more and more wireless. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we did it in the office, um, but obviously now we're not in the office. It's less relevant, but it really does give the direction of where we're going to go with 5G and where headsets are going to go. And these are my thoughts and how the industry is now going to progress. Because when we actually take the server, the workstation, 
the Cloud XR server, as I've got it here, which is an, an NVIDIA product, sits on top of the Rack workstation. I can now virtualize VR workloads. I can now have, remember that diagram that had the four GPUs inside of it? I could now actually have four headsets off of those GPUs. Now, in the traditional way, I would have to plug in the headset into the back of the GPU. Now, unless we're getting four people all congregating together inside the freezing data center and violating their social bubbles, then that's not going to happen. We need to get that VR data, which as we know, is very time and latent sensitive because we don't want to start having people getting mismatched images inside of VR, blowing out the synchronization, and then the lizard brain thinking something's wrong and evacuating stomachs, right? That doesn't do us or our customers any good whatsoever. So what we need to do is to make, make sure that we're giving a good experience, and we do that through Cloud XR. We can then virtualize, as we saw in the previous slide. We can then have the VR workloads running on each one of those virtual machines and then stream that out as we would have done screen data, except this is now VR screen data and audio, and put those out into the router. Now, the router is dual radio, 5 gigahertz, so off the shelf, but you, know, you need that bandwidth. You need the dual radios if you want to run four headsets. Now, we've seen training environments where people are observing distancing rules and actually having four people in the same location, all socially distanced and whatever else inside of that room, but all wearing wireless headsets, having this data being driven from the local data center. Right? That is now streaming across standard 802.11 AC, so gigabit wireless. Uh, it's running on a Vive Focus Plus. So the Vive Focus Plus is the 802.11 AC headset, normally standalone with a Snapdragon inside of it. And you run a standalone experience normally, which doesn't give you the fidelity as if you were running it on a big workstation. So you're getting reduced fidelity because of the horsepower that's available to you. Now imagine you're just running a client that's sitting inside of the headset, a Cloud XR client, and you decode that data into the headset. You're now getting a full workstation fidelity graphic experience being delivered to you wirelessly for up to four users. Those four users can interact in the same VR application, or they can interact in their own instance of VR applications and then go through a VR chat room or sync like we saw earlier. See how I'm tying all this together now? I, and that allows you to then have all those multiple users wirelessly communicating with each other or having a VR experience. We also have a program inside of Dell called Ready for VR. Ready for VR, you'll see it on the web page if you go to the store. All right, there's a logo there that says that this configuration will give you a good VR experience because we want our users to actually have a very good experience from the off and not buy something they think is going to do VR, but then they get disappointed or worse still feel nauseous after it. So by giving a good baseline, you can go up from there, but please don't go down, right? By buying that ready for VR experience, then you know you're going to have a good mainstream VR experience. Now, with any experience, you can go up in fidelity, you can go up in resolution, you can go up in the graphics, but that's not really going to give... Uh, you can't really allow for that inside of a configuration. And it's like buying a GPU. You have to buy the right GPU for the right application. You know, if you know you're going to be doing complex stuff, you're going to need more frame buffer. You're going to need more horsepower, more CUDA cores or whatever behind the scenes to be able to generate that amount of information. And in much the same way here, you can have that baseline and then you can move up from that in terms of graphics performance, in terms of CPU performance, and have an even better fidelity experience as you go through. So that's what we're aiming for and that's what we're trying for here. With this type of environment now with Cloud XR, I can actually run a Cloud XR client on something that perhaps wasn't ready for VR. So I've now uh, democratized the entry into VR and that's what it's about. VR used to cost a couple of thousand dollars four or five years ago to get a machine that could adequately deliver a VR experience. Now we're well below $1,000 for, for machines that can actually deliver that VR experience to you. It's been democratized, far more accessible. And then with the tools I mentioned earlier, everything being easier to create, we're starting to see a lot more VR adoption now for those training needs, especially in the situation we're finding ourselves in now. And then just to touch on the, the 5G aspect, Let's take that out a step further. 
Imagine in the future, we're starting to get to a world which is going to be 5G Edge Connect. It's a little ways out because, you know, 5G to be ubiquitous, you're going to have to have regularly spaced antennas out there in, in the wide world. And I'm not too sure whether, you know, being up in the mountains here, how quickly that's going to reach me. But we do see 5G being rolled out in local networks. So imagine you're on a campus. Uh, imagine you're on a, a museum, right, that type of environment. Uh, you can then control your airspace. You can control your 5G signals. Now, imagine if there was a headset later on that would allow 5G connectivity. You've got higher throughput, which is one of the benefits of 5G, and you've got lower latency, which, again, is another benefit of 5G. Now, lower latency and higher bandwidth just feeds AR and VR like there's no tomorrow right? because you've now got maximum bandwidth less latency for a premium experience. Imagine going to a museum and seeing an exhibit there and then having a VR or an AR experience that actually gives you more information. Imagine the exhibit was actually damaged and then AR could actually build it up in your vision to see what it looked like originally, all being delivered to you through a 5G type experience with that amount of data. And one of the things that you know makes me a little bit sad is that Notre Dame, for instance, over in, in France, you know, had a fire. There was a Brazilian museum that burnt down, destroying the artifacts that were inside of there. You know, the generations of the future are never going to be able to see those. Uh, imagine learning. Now you're at home. Now children are at home or whatever, and learning through a VR and AR experience because we can't travel. We can't go abroad. We can't do that. And imagine if they captured Notre Dame inside of VR or AR. Imagine if they captured the Brazilian museum with all the artifacts there before it burnt down. Everybody would still be able to see and appreciate everything that it would otherwise be missing due to the situation that we currently find ourselves in. So I'm hoping that as we move forward, we are going to go and preserve more for our future generations to be able to teach them through real exhibits and real examples using the technology that I've gone through today and make everywhere, hopefully, a better place. And with that, I thank you very much for your time. I hope you picked up some nuggets through there. I hope it was informative and uh, and you enjoyed it. But with uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring uh, Buzz back into the discussion. For some Gary, time. that was amazing as always. I always learn something when I listen to Gary Reverend, I, I swear. And it's not just the accent. Um, <laughs> One of the things you talked about, we do have a question here, and I think we have about enough time for one question. But um, uh, you know, I'm I'm personally a, a big, huge fan of of uh, thin clients and zero clients and and remote access. Uh, I use a lot of PC over IP uh, hardware, much of it yours. And uh, we do have a question in here regarding um, the zero clients and whether they can feed as many monitors as are used in the LED volume example. So. Um, does that give you enough information? Uh, it it does, I think. So, uh, I mean, bring me back in if I go off track. But when you're actually doing the the remoting, you're really limited to about four monitors right, inside of that. Uh, certainly when you get up into higher resolution. So depending on the, the resolutions of the panels that you're actually trying to drive at the other end, uh, you, you haven't got, you know, the, the way of doing more screens. In the Zero client, there's a two-screen version, and then there's a four-screen version. If you want to do more, you're going to have to add more host cards at the workstation end, and you're going to have to have different IP addresses for those, those, work, uh, those workstation cards. So we have seen situations where we've put multiple Teradici host cards inside of a workstation and multiple graphics adapters. And so therefore, you could scale up that way but certainly if you're looking at 16 32 whatever else then that's going to be a no because you're just not going to be able to scale out that much from a single platform you'd have to use multiple platforms multiple gpus multiple cards great well thank you for that and i wish we had time for more questions and i miss seeing you in person i guess this is the next best thing but thank you so much for spending time with us today um, again, I'll always learn something, and you guys are doing such amazing work there. So thank you for doing this remotely. Really appreciate that. No, love it. Stay safe. Cheers, boss. Right, you too. Take care. So last week, the studios in Hollywood and the major guilds and the labor organizations agreed to a new set of guidelines to gear up production as soon as possible. 
But what do safety protocols actually look like? How do they impact the schedule and the foot traffic on a soundstage, for example? So for answers, we have asked our Advanced Imaging Society board member, Rami Katrib of Digital Film Tree to help us out. Rami and his colleague, Andrea Anacito, uh, Anacito Chavez have been working with key studio stakeholders to build a, a system that can bring production and safety concerns together using what they call the safety viz system. This session is 30 minutes long and without further ado, please take it away. Rami and Andrea. Hi, Hi there. Hey. <laughs> so I am Rami Katri, founder of, C of Digital Film Tree, and Andrea. I am Andrea Nassetto. I am a producer and game engine artist at Cinecode, the virtual production arm of Digital Film Tree. Um, so at Cinecode, what we specialize in is pre visualization and final visualization for film and TV and indies. So what we mainly do is we leverage game engine technology in our workflow, um, whether it's Unity or Unreal. And we then go into the game engine and we're able to create scenes in 2D and 3D um, that help pre-visualize or tell stories, generally speaking, to even coming up with cinematography, shot lists, and stunt performances, and in some cases, safety. So we started working on safety viz um, approximately uh, three months ago. And it started as an ETC project, which I call a techno production that leverages a lot of state of the art and emerging technologies um, for an actual USC production, which was called Ripple Effect. And the idea of safety viz from the beginning was to help productions and studios get back to sit, get back to the set safely. So we were approached by my friends, Eric Weaver and Greg Chaccio. And the idea made a lot of sense to us because we had already been doing creative visualization um, to help productions organize and prototype their stories before they go on set. So we, we, took the, the tools we have, the game engines, and we leveraged one of our scanning partners, Virtual Productions, to scan uh, the two sets that were being used by the Ripple Effect production uh, at XR Stages and Lux Machina. And we built the environment based on the script and all of the COVID safety controls that were being assembled uh, to provide safety procedures, safety protocols on set. That included us uh, coordinating not only with the production heads, <clears throat> but also the COVID safety officer, Catherine. So in about a day, we scanned both of the sets. Uh, Andre started building the environment and then we presented the environment to uh, the production heads and the COVID safety officer. And one of the most interesting things was right away, it gave everyone visibility to the challenges and the revisions that needed to take place right away. Um, Andrea uh, started by putting forward some safety narratives. And then over the course of a couple months, we revised those narratives because the environment is live, it's modifiable. Um, so where we started and where we are now has evolved greatly. So with that, I'll have Andrea jump into the environment uh, and where we are right now. Yeah, so um, I just wanna confirm Rami that you can see my screen. I can. Okay, great. So I'll play this out um, throughout. So. The idea here was with the safety viz, we could essentially figure out where productions would be located, entrance and exit paths that they would need to take once they're on set, um, and also figuring out what kind of interactions they would have with one another when working closely amongst each other and trying to prevent that from happening given that you know we're in the middle of a pandemic. 
and we want to make sure that people are as, as social distance and as safe as possible. So while well, we were able to do that visually, I think one thing that is important to know is that we wanted to provide accuracy with what we were going to do. So Rami mentioned the scans. So these scans were created by Virtual Wonders and they're LiDAR scans. And if you're not familiar with what that is, essentially a LiDAR scan is a scan of an environment or an object per se. And that scan actually has the accurate height and dimensions of a location. Um, so we're actually able to get those measurements. And with those measurements, we can actually see like how many people would actually fit on set. And because we had those measurements, we decided to create a variety of different tools that would help guide us in this process. And two of the first tools we created were the ring lights. As you can see in the video, there's a ring light attached to each character. And when it turns red, uh, this is supposed to mean that it's actually below six feet. So that, that way you know they're not being socially distanced, they need to stay apart. And when they're green, like you see on this image here, that means there are more than six feet. And you're actually able to see that data by looking at the bottom right corner of the screen, there is a measurement that's rolling while we are having the characters move. And it's always recording the closest distance to them. So the reason why we created this for the narrative was not only so we could see that data, but also that helped drive the narrative. So anytime we would have a session with the COVID safety officer, they would be able to see like, okay, the, this need, they need to be more spread apart. Like, can we make them 10 feet instead of six feet? Let's see if there's extra space. So we're able to see that there. And we were able to um, come up with the narratives that way. And then from there, we wanted to make sure that our tools weren't just gonna be part of um, coming up with a visual narrative, but also coming up with data that could be used on a call sheet per se, or a way for other people to understand what was going on. So for example, um, and I can show you this on a different video. Let's see. The next thing, whoops, hold on that. Sorry, wrong video. The next thing we created was a mini map. So this mini map looks essentially kind of like a board game. However, there is a lot of data on it. So I'll explain to you what's going on. So the mini map is an overall bird's eye view of the whole set. So we're actually looking at things from the top as if there was no ceiling. And there's a variety of different data on here. All of the data that I will go over can actually be extracted as its own standalone. Um, so the first thing to know is we wanted to make sure it was actually clear where each department would be. So we built color-coded squares that would allow that the cast and crew to know like where they would be stationed that day. So on the bottom right, we created a department key that would tell us like the green would be for the art department, the orange would be for camera. So that way they would know where they would need to go the day of to put their personal belongings or equipment. And from there, we actually built out um, entrance and exit paths. So this made it clear in terms of like how they could navigate through the space. Um, so it wasn't just like people, you know, show up on set and they're wandering around, they stopped being socially distanced. So we wanted to make sure we could add those markers so that way they could get through the entrance path. For example, if they went through the entrance, they would then be led to a sanitation box and then they can go to their department from there. Um, so everything we've spaced out of according to social distance measurements. And another very interesting tool we've developed here uh, with the mini map was the wall distance data. And that's actually represented by the white arrow, which is kind of in the middle of the picture. It's set to 80.63 feet. And that wall distance data, if I was to play it in real time, this is just a rendered video. Um, when I'm in the game engine, I can actually move that arrow around and it'll give me the dimensions of each room in this space. Um, and I can also make it uh, vertical or horizontal, um, even diagonal. So you're able to get that data in real time. And this definitely helps for something like location scouting. Like let's say um, not everyone can get to the location. Uh, they'll, they'll, they would be able to get that data even from just stepping on to the game engine and working with us on that. Um, another measurement that we're not seeing on here is even having the measurements of the departments was something that we had recently added as well. Um, and then that would also tell them like maybe they had 20 feet of space to put equipment 
Um, and then also uh, the last thing is, is that we continue to add in the ring lights and the distance data for each character on this, which you can see being represented through little spheres and circles on here. So I think for each, so I think what's most fascinating here is that no matter what the narrative is or how it's being changed and modified in real time, this mini map continues to be exported with each shot. Um, so the data consistently gets updated because we know things are always changing on set. Um, and that's one of the benefits we have with the tools that we've created. They can always be modified in real time. And, and speak... oh, go on. No, go, go ahead, Andre. Um, so one thing to note on here is that this is, while well, this is being used for safety visualization, it can also be used um, for story visualization as well. So for example, we actually, um, I, okay, we, so this is actually, so let me start with this. So this is a still from the ripple effect. And usually what we would do is we would pre the story and figure out ways where they can continue to um, iterate on their creative process, but also in this case, follow um, social distancing guidelines. So for example, keeping the cinematographer six feet apart, trying to figure out what lens they would use to do that as well as maybe seeing how actors could cheat the shot by um, standing apart but looking like they're close together. And we actually have a previs version of that on here that I can show you. So that's this same shot. Um, however, this is in our virtual world. So we're able to get that same data that we would get from the shot that they would create in real life. And what I mean by that is, is that each shot that we create for previs actually comes with a camera data file. And that camera data file uh, could then show like what the lens is, what, um, what, who was the focus distance, and the camera resolution. Let's see if this actually opens. Here it goes. So it comes with a variety of different data, and more can always be added to it as well. Um, so this definitely helps with um, the creative department and with camera trying to plan out what shots they could uh, then create on set. And this saves a lot of time and money. And I'll take, Rami, if you want to take it from here. Sure. And I just wanted to also give some additional kind of high level background and context. Um, what you're seeing here is where we are with this particular production and all the feedback we got. So going back to the beginning, we're able to set up the environment within a day. And right away, we set up the environment using tools like Unreal and, and other tools. What was interesting is how the feedback came so quickly from department heads, from the COVID safety officer, from the DP. Uh, for example, after they actually got to set and started shooting, because we had the, um, uh, the, the safety vis visualization done before they went on set. That was the idea to help department heads plan and find the safety routes, uh, help camera departments understand how much space they have to work with. So some of the, 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 the initial feedback uh, after day one of shooting was we have way more equipment than what we thought. Uh, uh, this is inaccurate. So we need, we need this much space because we have this much equipment. Uh, another data point we got back was where they originally put the viewing station where uh, production uh, uh, would congregate to look at what's being shot was not in an optimal situation. There were too many crowds. So they put it in another location and that was prototype in the engine. So they, they would quickly see what locations are viable. And then you can space it out, uh, you know, like when you go to Starbucks and everyone stays six feet apart, you can space it out because the environment is topographically accurate. So you can validate ideas or approaches or solutions before you start production and after you start production. Essentially, everything you change is in real time. 
there are some aspects uh, that might take a little time if you all of a sudden added 50 avatars, uh, which was not part of the original plan. But it, it, everything is modifiable in real time. And it, it ended up providing utility and information uh, to everyone involved in production, not just the department heads. Uh, things as simple as this is the exit, this is the entrance, this is where makeup uh, is located, this is the actor area, this is the space for a camera department, and then to be able to take any one of those renders uh, from the environment, and as Andrea noted, attach them to a call sheet. So a lot of that feedback came back also from the uh, studio stakeholders uh, that are taking interest in these types of tools. So a lot of what we did was just keep up with the pain points and, and visualize and create narratives based on the pain points that were um, experienced by a variety of participants. Yeah, and I just want to add, because I think one thing people usually question is, like, how long does this take? Um, how, yeah, how long did it take us? Um, and I think that also depends on a case-by-case -case basis, like how Rami said, like, we don't know if there's going to be 50 people. Obviously, it might take a little more time. But one thing to note about all this, um, being in the game engine and the fact that, you know, we've been doing Previs for probably the past two years, uh, a lot of what we do is templatize. So our character assets and any object assets we have, we can just easily uh, click and drag those in. And even our animations are templatized. So making the movements and being able to show um, how they're moving from point A to point B is something that can be done in a matter of minutes. And as far as the environment scans, like in this case, we actually worked with two different environments and they both probably took about a day and a half to get up and running. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other noteworthy detail is when you do scan and set up in an environment, it's reusable uh, because other productions will go into those environments. The story might be different. And, and by story, I mean everyone involved. It's not just creative visualization. It's cast and crew. It's the entirety of the set reality. Even though those set realities might change, the set still is the same, all right? You have a wall here, wall here, minus all of the um, uh, equipment or particular needs of any given production. So uh, I think that uh, the, rela the relationships that have been built with both the, the physical set locations, even working with other companies that were doing previs on the same project, there was a ton of camaraderie. Uh, the idea of sharing assets. If someone is creating this asset, it can be utilized in the environment. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the most novel thing about this was we are telling a story. It's just a story about how to be safe on set and to be agile and to adjust that story in real time. Because, again, the thing that impressed me the most is when we set up the preliminary environment, it changed radically. Uh, even before production started, as soon as people started contributing their needs and, and started to solve the practical problems they had to solve before they went on set. Rami? Yes. Andrea, thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, of all of the conversations we've had in Hollywood, uh, you know, everything right now is surrounding the safety aspect of going back to set. And I don't think anybody's been thinking about it quite as deeply as you have. Um, I love talking with you about these things, too, because uh, there's, a, there's a philosophical side to this. There's a practical side of this. There's a very critical thinking part, part of this. And, and you seem to have uh, embraced all of that. Um, I do have a question in the chat here, uh, or I'll turn it into a question. It's more of a comment, but uh, it was related to uh, airflow and air exchange and how that has been discussed or factored into a solution like this since that's a, a bit more of an intangible I guess in some cases it, it was it was so um, let me provide a little context the safety visualization are really based on over 300 controls including airflow for example 
best case scenario is airflow that environment every two hours. If that's not possible, at least daily, right? So that was discussed and, and that can be visualized. So consider this for a second. 300 controls, the, the amount of complexity involved to provide a safe environment, all of those are like a script. As, that's how we're approaching it, it's like a script. We just need to visualize something, whether it's simple, like the sanitation station is right here, or airflow, right? So um, those controls are available to everyone, by the way. They're posted publicly as part of the ETC uh, ripple effect project and uh, you know the, the common controls of course is six feet uh, uh, pathways uh, where everyone is supposed to go uh, but airflow is uh, uh, you can visualize it we just didn't happen to visualize that control because there were so many controls so we just pivoted towards all of the visualizations that were requested that were needed that's great Again, you've been thinking about this a lot and at a deeper level than most people have. Another question I have is, is more about now that there's a compliance officer on set, you know, who, who does this ultimately bubble up to and who is the primary user of something like Safety Biz in your mind? Um, I know Andrea will have a thought on that. Uh, we're noticing that there's a lot of variability in the... Um, COVID safety officer role. In some cases, it's someone that just takes that role. Uh, you're not aware of their background, but there they are. In other cases, they're highly qualified individuals that have a lot of clear uh, uh, instruction, advice, protocol. So, you know, it's a mixed bag in terms of who the COVID safety officer is, but at minimum, the department heads, I think, are critical. The department heads have to make decisions. The department heads have to manage liability. So for them, this is a tool. It just, it, it, it simplifies some of that complexity even before you go to a location. Even if you've never been to a location or been to a location, it lets you prototype uh, non-destructively, right? And validate some of these safety policies that can, that can come from a COVID safety officer or it could come from a department head that says, well, I need to do this. I got to do this, right? You can't block me from doing that. So those types of challenges can be hashed out uh, in advance. And then I think the idea is that you can find the best middle ground in terms of safety and creativity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to that end, I think, is it, are you finding also that, that people are rethinking what is actually essential physically on set and how to mitigate some of the needs for those people to be there and how they can participate remotely? I mean, I think the most important thing we can do is educate and simplify this mm -hmm. process. Um, because we have been uh, active since mid-March, we're working on productions we've experienced a mixed bag. Uh, some productions are just, uh, we, we don't even detect safety policies. Other productions are very engaged. It's such a mixed bag. So um, being able to simplify the process, um, uh, essentially make it like plug and play um, so that anyone can partake. Uh, not just a COVID safety officer, but the individual stakeholders that are running production. That's great. Well, again, thank you so much for everything you're doing to solve this particular problem. But also, thank you for your time today. Uh, Andrea, thank you for your time as well. I uh, appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Doing well. And uh, I look forward to the next time we can all be in a room and, and just um, share ideas. Because, again, I, I love talking with you guys. So thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Buzz. Thanks for having us. Sure. So uh, just to let you know, these videos will be available on the Advanced Imaging Society's YouTube channel. So please check them out and, and tell your friends about it too.
get them to come and check these out too. So a uh, very big, huge thanks go out to our team today. Gary Radburn and Matt Allard at Dell, thank you so much. Rick Champagne from NVIDIA, Michael Mansuri and team from Meetmo, and especially Christian Poe and Johan Romero. Also, a uh, heartfelt thanks to Damian Petro and his new Brave Media team. And of course, our friends at the Producers Guild of America, the Visual Effects Society, and the American Society of Cinematographers. With that, I look forward to seeing you all next week. So thank you for being with us. Take care.